So once again, Dr. McGill, I highly appreciate you taking the time talking about those highly interesting topics in the kettlebell world. They always float around. And what I really like to focus on is just the idea mostly on rotational exercises. I've talked to some experts who are saying that most people don't need rotational exercises. I'm kind of like on that road. Most people in the general sense of the general population because just getting the basics down pat. When, it, when we talk about the kettlebell, a swing, a deadlift, they press, they clean. So, but before we dive into this, I'm, I'm reading your book, as you can see behind me, which is, for me, I do have just a shallow understanding of, of the biomechanics and the, the biology of the spine, which is so incredibly interesting. So I'm digging through the book and I'm writing a lot of notes. So let's start with my first question that I'm having, because I actually asked this question on the YouTube channel. So that is, is back pain somewhat related to a genetic component? In other words, do some people have stronger, more stable spines than other people? The answer is yes. Mm. My colleague, Bill Maris, has an interesting uh, saying. He's a spine biomechanist like I am, but he's done probably the most comprehensive uh, studies of industrial back pain. And what he says about genetics is genetics loads the gun, mechanical exposure pulls the trigger, and psychology and neurology influences the pain response. So it's a one, two, three. Uh, so yeah, obviously, um, uh, let me give you an example and I'll, I'll start off with a, a <laughs> A little bit of a, a shocking thought for a lot of people. Okay. Could you train a St. Bernard to win at the Greyhound track? Probably not. Absolutely not. Yeah. You, would break, you would break the dog. Mm. So there is a first example of genetics. So as we work through genetic populations, for example, orthopedic disease has incidence rates that vary among genetic populations. So the uh, who in, let's just go across Caucasian Europe here as an example. We won't go mm -hmm. into the Asian and African gene pools uh, at, at this time. Um, who has the highest rate of hip dysplasia? Now, hip dysplasia is the ball slips out of the socket because the socket is not very deep. However, the opposite side of that argument is you genetically have a lot of hip mobility. It's Poland. Poland has the highest rate of hip dysplasia. Now, where do the best deep squatters come from? Poland. Well, you, you look at Poland, Ukraine, Bulgaria, and it goes down into a Dalmatian variant into uh, former Yugoslavia, or the Slavic uh, hip. So what is somewhat of a orthopedic issue is also a great mechanical advantage now if you were to measure power production in some now i'm not saying all poles have a dysplastic hip that's not what i'm saying what i'm saying is on a population average so if you were to measure the power production in a deep squat out of the hole uh the dysplastic style of hip has tremendous power production deep out of the hole. Uh, and then usually the failure is at lockout, if we're looking at, say, a deadlift style. Mm -hmm. Versus, now let's go to the polar opposite orthopedic issue. Not a dysplastic hip, but FAI, femoral acetabular impingement. So here is a very deep socket. And so that limits because of impingement of the femur and the acetabulum, which is the hip socket in the deep squat. The highest incidents are among the Celtic nations, the Irish, the Scots, the Normandy, French, um, etc. So now where 
do the Olympic lifters come from? Uh, in other words, how many do you know from Scotland and Ireland? There will be the odd exception, but it's very rare. But now let's get back onto the platform and start measuring strength production. The failure is almost always at the initial pull off the floor, getting the weight moving. Uh, but once the weight passes the knees, hell and fury is unleashed. <laughs> <laughs> and they don't fail at lockout typically. So these are all um, issues to show how performance. Now, it, I've, I've given you some orthopedic uh, uh, disease examples and how they are linked uh, ultimately to performance. And uh, as you know, if the hips are not pulling the way they ought to be, the next one is the back. And uh, good hips quite often determine the incidence of low back disorders as well. So there's a little bit of a start on um, uh, genetics and uh, how uh, you also need the load exposure. And now that I've mentioned uh, load exposure, you also have to talk about rest. Uh, exposure creates adaptation. Mm -hmm. uh, can I continue on with this? I feel as though I'm, I'm going Most too definitely. long on this answer. Keep going. I'm, um, I'm listening. All, all right. So let's talk about what load does to any tissue. The language of tissues and cells that cause cell adaptation is load. Mm -hmm. So now we have to give a context of a tipping point. Consider vitamin D. There's a, a nutritional example. Uh, if you're vitamin D deficient, you're sick. So you take a supplement, get out in the sun and all of that. But once you cross the tipping point, vitamin D now becomes a poison. So do you see, as long as you stay under the biological tipping point of any kind of exposure, it's healthy. Cross the tipping point and you now accumulate uh, either uh, damage at the cellular level. It won't be seen on an MRI, mm -hmm. uh, et cetera. So now I can go back to uh, a spine example. Uh, loading the spine under the tipping point creates positive adaptation. But what is load? Load is a magnitude, how much mm -hmm. you are lifting. Mm -hmm. The way that you're lifting it, are you lifting it at a distance or close? So the external mechanics determines the load external. on the back. Mm -hmm. The internal mechanics are governed in an enormous amount by posture. If the spine is at the end range of motion, the ligaments are contributing a good proportion and sparing the muscles, but the ligaments have different vectors and they cause different uh, load uh, combinations of compression and shear to the spine. Um, load uh, is also duration. So if I held the load for a long period of time, tissues are viscoelastic, they creep slowly. Now, if I said to you, what is the determinant of injury? Is it force? Is it energy stored? Is it the rate of load? Actually, at the cellular level, it's strain. When, when cells are starting to pull apart, that's strain, mm -hmm. that is the, that is the necessary end yeah. game variable that, that mm. is required for injury. But if I just held a load, the ligaments are creeping, the cartilage of the joint is creeping. Do you get what I mean? Whatever mm -hmm. is under load statically, it slowly creeps. That's deformation. Mm -hmm. So if I was which to is, use... Which is um, a, a good thing, right? So the only thing that we have to watch is like you mentioned with time, just, just that I can follow up, is the deformation is okay, but as soon as it, the strain or if the load is too long, if I hold it for too long, this is where the, the problem comes in, right? Exactly. Mm. It's as you must stay under the tipping point. That's mm. the overarching concept. So let's mm. take a long bone. I'm going to bend a long bone. And I don't know if you want to get into these fundamental discussions of mechanics and injury or not. But here's an example. So I'm going to bend my forearm and the surface on the convex side of the curve goes into tensile loading. 
the other side goes into compressive loading. Well, bone is anisotropic, which means it's weaker on the tension side than it is in the compression side, as long as you've reached skeletal maturity. If you're immature, you get a green stick fracture, crush fracture on the compressive side, but most adults will be have a lower tolerance on the tensile side. That tension keeps going until you reach about one and a half percent strain. And then the osteons, the bone cells, start to debond. So do you see over time, just keep the same load there, and eventually <laughs> you build up enough of that strain. So that's duration. Repetition is another modulator of load. So if you keep repeating the stress strain reversals, so now an example might be a, a spondylolisthesis in a person who has had a stress fracture, which is a fatigue fracture mm -hmm. of the pars or the uh, pedicles and lamina, the neural arch behind the spine. Um, then there is a rate of load uh, if you load uh, a tissue faster, it doesn't have time to, to deform. So you could slip on ice in the winter time and land on your pelvis and expose your spine and pelvis to 20,000 newtons of shear load. Because it's quick for and fast. For 30 mm. microseconds, it doesn't have time to deform. Or look at uh, an MMA example. You can use a 16 ounce boxing glove which spreads out the load over time the brain has time to deform it's pretty traumatic for the brain because now it has time to deform um a bare knuckle kind of or more of an mma style of glove and we we've, we've measured the impact over time profiles of these things it's a sharper impact yes you get cuts and broken noses and things like that is it as traumatic for the brain? Well, time will tell, but I suspect uh, not. It doesn't quite have the time. Now, I mean, th that, that's a non-spinal mm. example. So mm. anyway, now all of this is modulated by rest. So load is good if you stay under the tipping point and then allow a strategy to deload. Mm. Uh, I could give you an example, if you like, on how those micro cracks actually are a good thing mm. if you then allow the system, uh, bone is piezoelectric, which means as you stress a bone, it creates an electric charge in the region of highest stress. Wow. That electric charge attracts free ions mm. of calcium and magnesium calcium. Yeah. Mm. that are floating in the plasma and the blood and whatnot, mm. and they suck and chemically bond. So now you're forming a bony callus over the region of highest stress. Which now, makes it stronger. Mm. Uh, which makes it stronger. Mm, but now, now let's violate the rest. If the next day you repeat the stress, the strain breaks the weak chemical bond. It's only been there 24 hours. But if you wait four or five days, now that callus forms and you grow stronger. So when we look at the grand old men of strength, power lifters, um, I haven't done bone work on Pavel, but I've done a lot of muscle work and we can talk about that if you like. But I will bet if he has a CT scan or an X-ray, the radiology will report, this poor fellow has sclerotic bone. Are you kidding me? That is the reaction of stress and laying down a bony callus. Um, if it's, you pick, it's, if yeah, mm. it's just uh, like with the with the calluses that you form in, in kettlebell training. If yes, if you wait. It, that's what I'm that's what we're actually teaching our clients is um, heavy snatching high intensity snatching with a uh, couple of minute sets with 20 to 25 rpm where you're going really fast with a weight that challenges you um, this may lead to calluses forming on your skin so that's why we recommend maybe twice per week these high intensity sessions so it's exactly the same analogy because the hand if you keep punching it it rips open again because there was no time to adapt that's why recovery is so important i love when a kettlebell man holds his hand up to the screen 
You and see the calluses. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's what's up. <laughs> <laughs> and so you work with that stuff. Yeah, it, it, it is what it is. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. So, um, yeah, I'm getting this. So we have to, I, I, before, before I had the podcast with you, I rewatched Squat University's podcast with you and Ed Cohn. And I, I've watched it now twice, which is such a wealth of information, what, what, what one can get out of this podcast. And I love what Ed Cohn says when it comes to recovery. And that's something that even I have to live and learn, or I have to learn it and, and I have to live with it, where Ed Cohn says, most people live too heavy for too long. So that's where problems occur. So I have to even sometimes force myself. We just came out of a full recovery week after 12 weeks of training. Angie um, and I, we always do it. We settle for a whole week. We don't train at all to really let, let the re recovery process catch up. So, yeah, recovery. How important that is. Now, with the next question that I'm having in, in your book, which I find so fascinating, is... I always thought when it comes to spine strength it's, or uh, spine safety, so to speak, um, it's all about strength. You have to have a, a musculature that, that surrounds the spine and has to be strong. And you are saying, well, in the book, endurance is a very high factor. If you could elaborate a little bit on, on that point. Yes. Every discussion needs a context. So I will give you several contexts. Let's go to, uh, and I should say that, uh, you know, I was a professor for over 30 years and 100% of our activity over those 30 years was directed to spine issues. Mm -hmm. And we talk about our six pillars of evidence. We had a lab where we took actual spines and we loaded them and we tested them. What you learn about the way tissue damage accumulates can only be acquired from that kind of laboratory. We learned about the architecture of certain spines and why they develop more stress and injuries than others, etc. We had another lab where we measured real people and quite often them top athletes, measuring their technique the way they activate the muscles, the postures that they go into to migrate loads onto ligaments, different parts of the disc, mm. onto bones, et cetera, through, mm. through technique change. And then we were one of the first to actually measure spine stability and what were some of the key aspects there that uh, made a person increase their injury resilience, for example, and how essential it is for uh, a performance. Then I developed a imaging uh, facility. Uh, so we had micro CT, X-ray, uh, uh, high resolution ultrasound to watch muscles contract and the dynamics of muscle tearing and this kind of thing. Uh, I, then we developed a clinic, an experimental clinic to test on people in rehab mm. uh, different ways to assess them and different rehab protocols mm. and then we did quite an extensive follow-up to see who got better and why mm. and who failed and mm. why mm. Uh, then we did epidemiological studies mm -hmm. and then we did population-based uh, studies and clinical trials uh, on uh, the police uh, firefighters military groups sports teams uh, and that kind of thing so it, it was a, a fairly uh, extensive approach. So with that now, oh, and I should say in the clinic, every single patient became a case study. So uh, if you were uh, a world record holder in a, say a certain strength sport, we wanted to know what were the features that either God gave that person mm -hmm. or that they were able to adapt mm. so successfully. Mm -hmm. And what mm -hmm. were the features that caused them to become disabled? Because every person who comes to see us has an existing back issue. Mm. And then the experiment in progress is, can we now test our scientific theories and clinical theories to get that person back to world-class 
And I think we've done that a few hundred times now wow. in many, many different sports. So I, I thought that was important to, uh, to set the stage. So uh, just take me back now. I was going to talk about an epidemiological study. What was the, the original question? And I'll get right on target for you. The strength and endurance idea. Yeah, that, yes. Yeah. I, mm -hmm. I got it. Mm -hmm. So I'll start that uh, discussion with a study that we did of men, all men, and their job was chroming car bumpers in a factory. The car bumpers weighed at about uh, 30 kilo or just over 70 pounds. Um, some of those men never had a back issue, never lost a day of work, fine. Mm -hmm. The other group had episodic pain. Uh, they would have such acute pain that came on suddenly and it would take them out of work for about two weeks. And wow. they might have one or two episodes like that per year. Mm. We spent half a day measuring every worker. We knew their muscle strength, their endurance, the type of hip socket they had. Mm -hmm. We watched them work to measure their movement characteristics because mm -hmm. movement determines the stress concentration distribution throughout mm -hmm. the skeleton and throughout the body. What do you think was the profile consistent with being resilient? I've just mentioned strength, endurance, and the way that you move. So I'm going to give you the opportunity to throw out some predictions. I would say the guys that were healthy or that didn't have no back pain, they used their hips when loading the bumpers, or they had better technique. Exactly. That mm. was one. That exactly. Was one. Now, do you mm. think they were stronger in their back? In not, probably in their hips they were stronger because they were using it on a regular basis. And that's why you're smart. That's exactly <laughs> right. We've measured awesome. group cohorts of power lifters. The closer the power lifter lifts to world record in their weight category, the more the proportion of strength and extensor moment comes from the hips and the less from the spine. The farther away you are from world record, in other words, you are a poorer lifter, the more they use their back and the less they use their hips. Now, again, there are anatomical reasons for that because the great squatters have shorter legs, particularly mm -hmm. shorter femurs. So mm -hmm. you take an NBA forward basketball player with a long femur, mm -hmm. they're not going to be the yeah. best. Player <laughs> no, <lifter> never. <laughs> because the mechanics aren't there. Yeah. So there, uh, just to finish off the Chrysler uh, car company uh, study, uh, the workers who were resilient had more back endurance. And what it turned out when we watched them move is they moved more efficiently using their hips and their spine less for longer. So you see you need a endurance base to keep good form. Oh. And then when you lose good form, now the stress concentrations start to migrate to more vulnerable tissues. So the wow. kettlebell, oh, I wish we could, I hope you take me to the kettlebell. I, I think you will, yeah, but I, I, will. I, will, I, I will start to describe some of the protocols and the Russian systems are so clever. And I think I'm the only guy who's measured them. Awesome. But um, so they're more endurable. They're less strong in the back. They use their hips more and they used more clean movement. So uh, you sent me a video of a guy loading firewood. I hope you know that we heat with wood here. We mm -hmm. always okay. have. So okay. <laughs> in, Stu in central Ontario here knows how to split and stack firewood. So okay. you can lock your hips and turn, pick up a bucked up log and turn like this, if you wish. But if you turn the hips, do you see what I'm doing now? That my the stress wow. just went to the ball and socket joint. It didn't, I didn't lock the hips. And the third part is footwork. So if I have a really heavy log, the first thing I'm going to do is pull it to my hips and then I drop step. So I'm just going to come on back a little bit. And with just a little bit of footwork, I drop step and turn 
and place the log. Now, if I don't do that, I've decreased my capacity for work underneath the tipping point. So mm -hmm. the whole idea is to use technique to keep expanding the training volume below the tipping point. And if you don't believe me, come to jujitsu class and I will put you in a few postures immediately, not me, you're the instructor, and they will show you immediately how poor posture, yeah. poor technique will break you like that. So that's what jujitsu is. Wow. And yeah. I wish clinicians and coaches would just take a couple of classes and learn why certain postures and movements uh, you know, I see people, they roll over in bed and they jujitsu their own arm. Jujitsu their own arm. And instead of learning, if you just straightened your leg and, and, and rolled, but start with a shrimp first, which is a jujitsu shrimp and roll, it's all so easy because yeah. you have to, you have to use good technique and, uh, you know, go train with any of the Gracie's. And mm. they will show you that if you're using a lot of strength, you're, uh, it's, it's because you're technique deficient. With, with the log lifting and what I've just heard is, as far as I understand it, sometimes, and then we can jump into the kettlebell world, which I'm, uh, of course, highly interested in uh, what your science, what, what your research is saying. Um, I, I see it that way. Uh, sometimes people engage in suboptimal form to be more time efficient on the expense of your spine, right? So because that's like if I if I'm saying no, because that's what I'm hearing a lot. It's yeah, but that goes faster if I just bend down, I flex, or I go down into a deadlift, I rotate, I have a little bit of flexion, I pick it up, I'm faster, more time efficient. Yet, do I see it correctly that in that way you are loading your spine the wrong way because you're not pivoting with the hips, which I saw you do it, which looks like a windmill, or in the Turkish get up the side hinge, where you are uh, uh, pivoting the weight on your hips. So if you're not doing this, yes, you're saving time, but you're also accumulating these stress factors on your spine that will, like you mentioned in the podcast with Squat University, that probably will lead to a problem like smoking, not today, not tomorrow, but maybe in 15 years. Is, is that a correct way to interpret this? I think so, yes. So think of the years it took and the amount of scientific effort to prove that smoking caused cancer. And the reason was there were always those science deniers who said, oh, they, and for some, they, they did have their financial reasons to argue mm -hmm. against the science, but the science mm -hmm. had a tough time primarily because of the delayed effect. You know, I think of the Marlboro man. Do you remember Marlboro yeah, cigarettes? Yeah. And there was yeah. the very the healthy with, looking, yeah, uh, the, the guy on the horse, the horse. beautiful yeah. man, yeah. Marlboro cigarette, hey, I don't have cancer, it's fabulous. <laughs> That's the life. Yeah. But do you <laughs> remember him? laying in bed dying and he said i've made a terrible mistake and i i wish i could have had it all back to do all over again mm. but the reason is uh back issues are the same because of the cumulative nature of mm -hmm. uh you cross the tipping point which is uh, we all do it mm -hmm. uh but then you're going to have to pay the price now mm -hmm. of appropriate rest and hopefully you will recover uh but as i said every person that comes here will have some tissue damage mm. and uh, mm. they will never be uh what they once were but you know i'm i'm just uh, i wrote a book with brian carroll who uh, uh came here in 2013 with a very substantial uh, back injury we show his mris at that time and uh you know he was at the end of his rope he told by everybody that he's mm. finished and I, I honestly thought he was too but I said uh, let's try this as an experiment in progress we did a little bone callusing but Brian is a very special human he's such a professional in that he took a year to do 
the deload and wow. the building of base endurance, the building wow. of base motor patterns. Then the year after he started his athleticism training once again, and no one knows how to squat more than the guy who's already set uh, a couple of weight class categories. And I don't know if you know the story, but he came back and squatted 1,306 pounds. Uh, it was earlier Awful. this year, uh, which is by the way, the all time, all weight category human record. So uh, it, it's, it's a little bit of a testament of what we call mechano stimulation. I started off at the podcast talking about how to stimulate adaptation, but there's a, a real set of strict scientific laws, the laws of biology, and they rule. You cannot beat biology. You will always lose. So you have to play by those rules. Mm. And, uh, and if it, you know, if you want me to give you those rules, I, I've given you some of them. But now the practice side of it is the real challenge. Mm. It's an art and it's a science. So yes, I think we're quite familiar with the scientific rules, but now the next person comes in and I look at their uh, genetic elements of their body. I've looked at their past successes and failures. I've done extensive assessment to really understand the nature of their injury. But now, um, how much volume of the rehab do we do? That is where the artistry mm -hmm. comes into yeah. it. Yeah. So, uh, you know, we work on different combinations of uh, Let's take someone who's quadratus lumborum compromised. Mm -hmm. Well, we yeah. learned quite a long time ago, and it was from measuring uh, competitors in strongman competitions. When you walk, uh, the hip biomechanists, the people who are experts in the mechanics of walking, say that in order to walk, if I plant my left leg and swing my right, my hip abductors hold my pelvic platform up and level. Otherwise, I would fall to the ground. So the hip mm -hmm. uh, abductors look after that. But what the curious thing was, when we measured world-class competitors doing a yoke walk, so they put yeah. an ungodly amount of weight on their yeah. and they take small little steps, we found that they didn't have the hip ABD, AB uh, duction strength. I remember measuring one very good competitor who had 500 Newton meters of hip abduction strength. I could lay on his foot and he would just pop me up into the air wow. ungodly. And yet when I measured him carrying a competitive super yoke, he needed 750 Newton meters. In other words, he was strength deficit, 250 Newton meters yeah. or a third. Yeah. So where did the missing strength come from? The missing strength came from, as we found out, the core muscles so you can imagine if I can have left leg stance, I'm just going to move the screen down a tiny bit for you. Uh, left leg stance. Um, I've, I'm running out of strength of my hip abductors, but quadratus lumborum and the obliques on this side hold the pelvic platform up. So with short little walking steps, I am now successful. Wow. I've just now let's go back. There is an extreme example of the importance of quadratus lumborum. Well, how many times have you heard a discussion in the training forums of the importance of quadratus lumborum? It's very rare. Almost rare. Yeah. No. Nope. Yeah. So now I'm going to take you to the opposite end of the spectrum. Let's go down to the neurological ward at the children's hospital and you will find a small girl who has a paralyzed quadratus for whatever reason. Watch her gait style. So the, um, left leg stance, quadratus lumborum, which is no longer there. It's this, this. So without a quadratus lumborum functioning properly, you can't even walk. So now that I've given you that example, what would you say is one of the best beginning exercises for quadratus lumborum? 
Oh, that's a great question. It, it's, it's the walk. I, it's okay. walking. Yeah, it's, it's walking. walking. Now, <laughs> thinking I'm too far. Yeah, let's make mm. it simple. What am I doing now? A yeah. loaded carry. Isn't mm. that the best exercise Most for? Now, what have I just done? Increased I've added it. even yeah. more of a control demand. So you're starting mm. to see now mm. uh, some of the science behind what you do and uh, its importance. Wow. That's, that's why the farmer's walk is such a powerful exercise. Ah, yields. But Gregory, I didn't do the farmer's. I did suitcase. Yeah. The suitcase, farmer's, farmer's walk. It's yeah. bilateral. Mm, both, yeah. Yes. So yeah. that is yet... And I'm not talking through my hat. Again, I think I'm the only guy who's measured the spinal loads comparing a suitcase carry mm -hmm. and uh, a farmer's. Mm -hmm. So a farmer's is bilateral symmetry. Uh, so, yeah. It's actually less load. Le yeah, less, yeah. Because mm -hmm. it's yeah. more expensive to be unilateral. And I have yeah. uh, obviously a dominance on my offside but I need co-contraction on the yeah. other. The muscle action has a shorter moment arm than a counterweight on the opposite side. So mm. a farmer's walk, it's, I'm saying, I'm not saying it's a bad, it's a fabulous exercise, mm. Mm. but I was just using, if you really want to target QL, wow. be mm. very modest and, mm. and uh, you'll get a more targeted mm. stimulation with a mm. suitcase versus what, say, it's, yeah, that's what understanding of these exercises is so crucial for for a coach to really see these differences. It's like, hey, normally you would walk around like, hey, two kettlebells, very heavy kettlebells, that, that's tough. Now take only one. Well, that's light. Well, actually you have to ba uh, fight the, the anti-rotation aspect that you've just mentioned, which is another beast. And then that's why I actually wanted to ask this, the, the kettlebell bottom up where you see the application of it. And now you've just, uh, you've just answered the question. Yeah. Um, if, if I may, may, may I just take a minute or two and uh, mention people will find this interesting, uh, my, my journey, so to speak, with the kettlebell. Most definitely. So, just so wanted to yes, jump into yes, it. Yes, I was mm. a professor and uh, people are quite often surprised to come to the university uh, labs and clinic, which I retired from five years ago, by the way, but here at BackFit Pro, which is our, our clinic, uh, they're surprised to see kettlebells and belt squat machines and over a thousand pounds of <laughs> Olympic weights and all this kind of thing. When I, I, I'm going to tell you the very first time I met Pavel, it's, it's quite fun. I, I was uh, doing the keynote lecture at the uh, NSCA, the National Strength and Conditioning Association, and the other guy who was on the stage, and I followed him, was Brett Jones. Mm. And Brett was doing the bending of the red nail. So, as you know, to bend a red nail takes tremendous core strength, manual hand strength, uh, et cetera, it really puts the full neurology and, and strength profile together. Mm. Uh, and then as you get off the stage, there's usually a little gaggle of uh, delegates wanting to ask you questions. They didn't mm -hmm. want to ask in the question period because that could be embarrassing. But anyway, so the, I answered a few questions and there was a fellow standing in the back like this. And I noticed them right away. I noticed <laughs> the posture. I noticed the forearms and the grippers. These are the things that, you know, I notice and are impressive. And then uh, there was a little bit of a quietness. And I heard, sir, what do you think of this? And he turned to the person to the right of him and he said, you will volunteer to lay on the floor. <laughs> <laughs> this person laid on the floor who wasn't small, and it turned out to be Pavel. You know where I'm headed with this. Pavel bent down and did a perfect zercher squat and lift of that person off the floor. You ask the average person to pick a body off the floor, and they yeah, are very likely to hurt themselves. Most definitely. And he said, what do you think of that, sir? And I said, that is about the most confident expression 
of that lift as I've ever seen. We went to lunch and we've been best of friends ever since. So that was our opening. I knew this man was special. And then we've uh, done training together. We've compared notes. And the things that he has taught me, well-established Russian science. Uh, and again, I'm the guy who, who, who measured, is it true? Uh, and uh, we've learned so much. It's incredibly clever stuff. And I, I will also say, when we assess athletes, uh, part of what we do is to measure their neurology, how the muscles are activated and sequenced and the strength of uh, contraction and all that kind of thing. We use uh, electromyography, which measures the electrical profile of the muscle, and we mm -hmm. use various maneuvers to convert that into strength. We have to hold down the athlete performing a maximum effort isometric contraction of all of their core muscles. Wow. I've felt the strength of world-class sprinters, strong wow. men, uh, NFL football players, uh, some of the top uh, most lethal fighters in the world. Pavel, who weighs about the same as I do, had the strongest rotational core. Wow. Now, Let's assess how Pavel trains. Mm. Does he use a lot of repeated rotation through the spine? And I just told you, I cannot hold him when he wants to rotate. He would bam, throw me through the room with a pulsed strength of speed, but he does it through the hips, locking the core. So he trains to stop twist to create the most impressive rotational strength. Do you see it's almost a bit mm. of a... Uh, oxymoron. A, yeah. An oxymoron, mm. yeah. So mm. if you watch Pavel do a, uh, uh, say, a landmine exercise, it isn't freezing the hips and rotating through the spine. I don't even know if I can even do that. <laughs> Locking the, mm -hmm. the hips and rotating yeah, yeah. through the spine. It is tall. Lock it in and through the hips Pivoting. and then power breathing mm -hmm. you see what i'm doing i'm pivoting mm -hmm. around the feet mm -hmm. so it is um uh something that you observe and learn and then from dan john you learn the incredible athletic development of well-designed and programmed carries. And really, before Dan John, carrying things in a gym was extremely rare. And wow. he's made enormous contributions. Uh, I've got a picture of Dan when he was a young fella walking through a field dragging with a harness and carrying two big kettlebells mm -hmm. now this is real this is this is uh, dan and i are the same age almost mm -hmm. two months and uh i go back to uh he threw the discus i threw the discus believe it or not uh, oh, nowhere oh, really? near okay competitive as dan uh, nowhere near and he was a hell of a lot stronger than uh, i was i tried hard well, let's put it that way but <laughs> yeah. uh you know, I, I would never have known about dragging in my uh, 20, uh, late teens, early 20s. It was unheard of. My, my coaches didn't uh, do that kind of thing. But anyway, there was just a little bit of a, mm. a uh, personal story about uh, people who have influenced you. And uh, I've met Steve Cotter a couple of times, your, mm -hmm. your sensei. Mm. Of all of those three men, what's common? They know their stuff. Yeah. They're quiet and humble. Yeah. Not out bad mouthing people. They do it. Professionals. Yeah. You see what I what? And every single one of them are are, the, are very kind men. Mm hmm. Yeah. yeah. What, what I really love about um, if we just pivot into kettlebells now. Um, what I've loved about Steve is that I have initially been exposed to the kettlebell sport idea of training. 
when it comes to the ballistics, the clean, the snatch, the swing. That was more when Steve taught us the way he does it with the IKFF is more like a kettlebell sport approach because he traveled to Russia and saw how the Russians do it, which is a different type of training with the kettlebell. So pivoting back, then I've learned the heart style from Luca Kurce, who is, um, I think you're familiar with him as well. I, I know Luca. <laughs> Luca, yeah. So I've, I've learned massive amounts of him and I see where the philosophies um, come together. And that's why I even talked to one of the world champions. Her name is Brittany van Schrevendijk. Uh, she's a kettlebell world champion with double 24s and 20. She, she set massive amounts of world records. And even when I talked to her, we came up with the idea that you know, the kettlebell, when, when you practice kettlebell sport and heart style, you're actually a hybrid. And that's where this idea came from that I'm now pursuing is that th this hybrid idea, which I believe Steve Carter is the original hybrid because he combined heart style with the heart style swing with the chemo with the with the tension to keep it locked in your spine what, what i love what you said in the squat university podcast which i always say now as well is you you try to engineer out those sheer forces that are happening when you're on top of the swing but i believe it depends on what swing you're engaging in if you're engaged in a kettlebell sports swing the tension on your on the spine Probably, but you you maybe give uh, have have some great insights. I believe a kettlebell sports swing does not have the same amount of shear on the spine than a heart style swing, which has a lot more force, and you tend to use heavier weights when we combine these two swings. What what would be your take on this? If you if you take a look at the kettlebell sport idea with the pendulum, very soft, they sometimes even referred to as the soft style, or the heart style, in well, spine have, differences. I understand the question. The answer begins with context. The contexts are very different. The kettlebell sport is one of endurance. It's you're looking for the most efficient way mm -hmm. to swing the kettle. Hard style is training. It's a very, very different context. You're trying to create mm -hmm. a pulsing strength. Mm -hmm. um, Whereas in the sport, you're trying to conserve your strength so yeah. you last longer. Mm -hmm. So th there you go. Uh, that uh, is, is pretty much the, the end of the answer. But I can explain the mechanics of shear and whatnot, because once again, I think uh, I'm the only guy who's measured compression and spinal shear mm. in uh, different styles of uh, kettlebell swings. So, uh, do you want a little bit of a yeah, an most, on that? Yeah, yeah, most yeah. of So, I'm not going to uh, get in the cage and pick up a bar, but I'll, I'll just mimic this. So, say I'm going to do a deadlift. So, I'm just going to go down, put my hands on my knees, organize my spine, organize my shoulders, set the curve right. In other words, set up my hips to do their job, set up my spine to become a rigid derrick and allow the hips to pull mm. uh, through, uh, et cetera. So you can't push rope, but you can push a stone. So I'm setting the mobility parts up and I'm setting the stability parts up. Now, when I start, I, I wedge in and now I start to pull through with the load. At the beginning of the start, you see that there's massive compression down my spine, but there's also shear. The load pulling down through my arms is pulling my upper mm -hmm. body forward. Mm -hmm. Gravity acting on my body is pulling my upper body mm -hmm. forward. So mm -hmm. there is a shear load there. Well, uh, your spine is designed to support that shear governed by a tipping point. That's the key. Mm -hmm. So the facet joints posteriorly, you see what I mean? They, they, they create a stop, a mechanical stop to the vertebra shearing forward. If you flex a little bit, you open up the facets and you lose some of that uh, shear uh, ability. But if you lock it in and then stiffen it, you've now engineered out some of yeah. that shear load. Now, mm -hmm. if you measure back pain athlete, just generically back pain athlete, most of them will have an intolerance to shear. And if you know how to assess it, you'll find it very quickly. Mm -hmm. So shear is their pain trigger. Now, 
if I do a let's get off pain and just go back to a very confident deadlift. So you see there's a normal ratio in a deadlift of compression and shear. Without crossing the tipping point and without existing injury, the body is quite resilient to withstanding, shall we say, or, or thriving with that amount of compression and shear. Mm. Mm. Now let's look at the kettlebell swing. So, well, I don't need to swing just at the moment, mm. but imagine I have mm. a kettlebell. Mm. I start out with the normal compression and shear, but as we pull the hips through and the kettlebell peaks at the top of the arc, there is a centrifugal force creating a shear, mm. you see, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and compression. Now, the ratio of compression and shear suddenly changes, whereas the top of the deadlift and lockout, it's compression, the shear is now gone. Do you follow? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So the kettlebell is different than yep. a, uh, a, a deadlift. So you will find, and when I wrote that kettlebell article, I quoted, well, a record setting holder, raw power lifter who had a disc herniation. And he said, the kettlebell swing returned me back to successful power lifting. Wow. I use it for every warm up, etc. The next athlete I quoted is known as being a very strong man, but he says, you know, I, I can do anything with my back except the kettlebell swing tweaks it just a little bit. Wow. And I will tell you in my own training over the years, uh, I would have been in my late 30s when I first picked up a kettlebell and I had a little bit of instability at one of my joints. I could swing a kettlebell, really enjoyed it for about three, three weeks, two or three weeks. And then my back would get just a little bit tweaky. And I'm going to show you the mechanism in just a moment. Over time, there's a natural cascade to sheer instability to a spine. And most of the time, if you stop tweaking it in mm. sheer, it stiffens naturally. Mm. And now I'm in my mid sixties. I don't have any sheer instability. My spine has grown out of it. I can swing a kettle. Wow. And so do you see what I mean? Now, yeah. now here, here's the mechanism. When, uh, let's just talk about generic injury. Let's say we have a knee and we damage the ACL ligament. Mm -hmm. You do a drawer test on the knee to examine the amount of shear. Again, it's back mm -hmm. to shear, mm -hmm. shear laxity and uh, whether it triggers pain or not. But a normal healthy knee is shear stable. Do you see mm -hmm. the difference? Mm -hmm. Shear laxity, mm -hmm. yep. shear stable. Yep. When a joint is damaged, it becomes lax. It loses stiffness. It yep. loses stability. Yep. It needs another source of stability. Mm -hmm. Now let's take a spine. All of these models, by the way, are uh, built by dynamic disc designs who really incorporated the findings as we found them in our clinic and laboratory over the years. So we have three lumbar joints, L3, L4, and L5. L3 and 5 are normal. L4 has lost a little bit of disc height. It's a little bit lax. So when you let some air out of your, your front left car tire, it bulges mm -hmm. and it's a bit sloppy on the road. You mm -hmm. won't win the F1 uh, mm -hmm. race car series with a little air out of one tire. Mm -hmm. So now I'm going to apply a load to the top of the spine. Where's the majority of the motion yeah. occurring? In the middle. At the joint that yeah. has lost stiffness. Yeah. So do you see if you've had a little bit of a damaged joint, and we will find that through a test, uh, a prone instability test might be one. We have lateral shear instability tests in the clinic as well. If they are positive, we, would, we wouldn't prescribe a kettlebell swing. Mm. We may after we achieve shear stability, mm. but we wouldn't ah, at so, the outset. Ah, so, now, so it's, let's, yeah. Let, mm. Sorry. Mm -hmm. Yeah, keep going, keep going. Now I can go back to the kettlebell swing. You see, just to summarize now, you get a normal compression and shear ratio with a deadlift. A kettlebell swing is different. 
at the top, it works the spine in shear just a little bit, which if the person has the specific back pain trigger of shear, they won't do well with kettlebell swings. It will tweak them. And I explained my own path. Mm. But if they have shear stability, but say bending is their uh, trigger, kettlebell swing might be the perfect rehab tool. Wow. Now, let's go back into uh, history just a little bit. And I would work with Pavel, this is many years ago. And of course, the hard style, you swing through and then when you get to top dead center, he would contract. Whoop. Now, when you talk to him, I said, well, why would you do that? And he says, well, it builds stiffness and stability. Yeah. And so if you can then coach that person who is a bit sheer unstable, ah, I told you kettlebells after two weeks would tweak my back. When I did the keyme at yeah. the top, I engineered out wow. through technique now. Yeah. So it's posture, it's technique. I took an exercise. Now I'm also going to tell you, I have a little bit of spinal scoliosis, a little bit of a lateral curve. My Rib cage was broken on this side. It was, it's fused and it doesn't move. So if I was to breathe in, this side expands, this side doesn't. So when I move, I get good movement on one side. And again, it's just an old injury. Um, but I develop more meat on the right side of my back mm, yeah. than my left. Mm. But what is more perfect than a right-handed kettlebell swing, grab it in the air, left-handed? Yeah. I'm getting now some yeah. symmetry that would be hard to get through a barbell, if you, you see what I mean. So there's... <laughs> You know, people are always wanting me to say, oh, is this a safe exercise? Is this a good exercise? Do you see we need to set the context. stage in terms of context? It's always context, context, context. I think so, that's, the, that's the magic word in, um, the magic word in fitness is, is context. It depends. I, I think that's mm. the name of this podcast, yeah. really. Yeah. It depends. <laughs> it depends. And, yeah. <laughs> and, it, and context matters. Yes, context so, matters. you know, I, I listen to these various arguments, which to me often sound like schoolyard arguments. You know, oh, my dad can beat up your dad kind of mentality. But with the right context, I think a lot of people aren't that far apart. Mm. But the uh, media isn't... Um, designed to look for the context and the no, commonalities it's broad. It's the, that's it yeah well it's it's, it's it's to to create mm. literally the opposite mm. Mm. but uh anyway there's just a, a little bit of a thought and then we go back in history and uh i have two libraries of people here at backfit pro one is muhammad ali for mm. various reasons and the other is Bruce Lee. And some will remember Bruce Lee for these sort of cheesy movies and some of the, uh, you know, the Green Hornets TV series he shot and whatnot. But he also wrote wonderful textbooks that not too many people are familiar with unless you're a real Bruce Lee aficionado. And, you know, the first time, uh, I, 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 ne I never met Bruce Lee, but, in speaking with some people who did train with him, he homemade a kettlebell and he also created a pulse at the top of the swing. Yeah. Now out of that came the Genesis of the one inch punch. And we get right back to what Pavel talks about and what we've measured in so many sports, the pulsing neurology of great athletes, and what it does in enhancing. So if I had uh, a kettlebell and a bottoms up and I was going for a press, I'm not going to press it with my arm strength unless I didn't understand the technique. Mm. But if I could create a stone through my core and then just a quick pulse in my knees, bam, mm -hmm. it was a hammer. Yeah. A hammer yeah. transmitted through a rigid piece of concrete and now I've just punched the that's, kettle. That's yeah, that's the beauty of, of the jerk, actually. When when it, uh, it is. when you look at the Russian technique, the way uh, we do it as well, is where you, where you connect the elbow elbow to the iliac crest of your hip to really 
engage, get ready, and then you get in the dip. And the bump is actually that phase where you transfer the energy from your legs into your elbow. And then they, the bells go up. You profit from the law of inertia because when you go down in the second dip, boom, you actually work with, 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 with such a technique. That's why I love to, to watch the Russians. And that's why we see guys who are 64 kilo body weight lifting 232s, which is so massively crazy when we watch these people. So one thing that, that really strikes me now is that's one of the reasons why I believe, I mean, the kettlebell is a powerful tool. And the way I see it, maybe one of its flaws, uh, so to speak, could be exactly, we have the ballistics especially, the swing, the clean, the snatch, they're all hip dominant. And they always, no matter, I, I think no matter what style you're using, you always create these shear forces. And I've experienced this myself when you train almost exclusive, exclusively with kettlebells, that on some days I, I uh, intentionally avoid hip movements or, or, or hip movements that include a lot of velocity with heavy weights because I, I don't want my spine to always get exposed to that shear force over and over again. That's actually my thinking. And uh, that, really, that really helps me with the programming of kettlebell training. Where I'm on one day we're working with the snatch, then maybe in the last the last day of the week we're working with cleans or swings. But in the middle of the week, I work if I want to work the hips with a deadlift to not engage in those shear forces, which is something that I've understand th thanks to you and thanks to reading the book and understanding these these uh, intricate details, which is so powerful. As a last thing. You, you might be reading the wrong book to uh, Gregory, by the way, if you're talking about low back disorders, which I see behind you, mm -hmm. I actually wrote that for clinicians. That was the first book I, I wrote. Mm. And it's a lot on uh, very high level assessments, uh, mm. and that kind of thing. Mm. But the book to enhance, uh, well, if I could just say to get out of pain, people should follow back mechanic. That's what mm, that book. Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah. But then once they're out of pain, we're finned, we're finished with that stuff. Then mm -hmm. we move on to building yeah. athleticism and that book yeah. is ultimate back fitness and performance. Right. Yeah. Wh which, yeah. Which I'm having on the list too. And that's, that's yeah. one of the reasons why I think it's so important for me as a coach to refer out when, when I see that people are coming with, uh, um, um, problems or, or pain situations where I know I'm not equipped or, uh, equipped or qualified to, to tackle the situation, then I'm always like, listen, we have a very great physiotherapist in our network. You maybe talk to him first because when you work with us and when you work with kettlebells, you want to have a, a, let's say, a foundation where pain is not, uh, where pain hasn't reached a point where it's debilitating where you, you really need rehab in that case, where sometimes coaches get it mixed up. So it's like, I'm a physiotherapist, I'm a coach, I'm this, I'm that. So that's why I'm always highly focused. But that book is just, I, 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 so much information, but I actually like it to, to a certain degree where I see some stuff that, that well, I'm really you, you, by. You have the context to consume it, where mm. not everyone will. May mm. I ask, where are you located? In Switzerland, northern that's part. Where? Uh, close to St. Gallen, that's the German border, close to the German border, Lake of Constance. Gregory, 1994, I was a visiting professor at the medical school in Bern, Switzerland. Awesome. Three days of work, I, three days a week, I was, I worked at the University of Bern, and two days a week, I worked in Macklingen. Macklingen, that's close. It, this is why I'm telling you, you don't That's need to explain minutes. Switzerland. Yeah, so I worked <laughs> awesome. and uh, each each morning I would go up the funicular to the uh, awesome. Macklingen, which is your national athlete training center. Yeah. And people don't realize that. Yeah. And I, I know there's some old videos of uh, me and some athletes there awesome. kicking around. But that <laughs> was awesome. uh, 19. How old were you in 1994? 10 little too there, young. yeah yeah uh, there you go but anyway so <laughs> yeah. i i know switzerland well but it, back awesome. to that uh, thought on uh collaboration um we we have one 
a certified practitioner in uh, Switzerland, but we also have a different level of master clinicians as well. Mm. And uh, if someone like you, a master trainer, can collaborate with a master clinician, now you get the best of both worlds. Mm. You refer the people who are not they don't have enough training capacity yet mm, to enable capacity. you to use your skills. Yeah. Almost. So when you give them to a master clinician, their role is to get that person out of pain. They yeah. cannot stimulate yeah. the foundation for pain free mm. activity. Then they give them back to you yeah. and you work your magic and the world yeah. is a better place. So it's a wonderful and uh, sy synergy between a master clinician and a master trainer. And that's exactly why I think it is so important for a trainer or for coaches to understand that when, when you know you have somebody in front of you who needs an expert in a field that you're not the expert in, then don't, don't think about the money. Think about sending them out and don't think about applying highly complex exercises which will build and strengthen your body, no doubt about it. But I like this, like you said, if you don't have training capacity, it's probably a dangerous endeavor if you engage with these people like this. Well, and I've, a, yeah. a lot of trainers fail because they lose the client. The client can't tolerate their opening uh, programming. They don't have enough base pain-free capacity. So the clinician's job is to build that pain-free uh, capacity and then pass them back. Mm. And then the, then the magic happens. Mm. They then have their next client that comes in for back pain, they refer them on to you. And then the next one, they refer on to you. Mm -hmm. So all of a sudden now, it's just a propelling of two yeah. uh, competent clinicians, and then the success rate goes right up. Rather than awesome. the person going to a clinician, the clinician does not do an assessment, but they get paid to do injections, or they get paid to do a surgery, or they get paid to do mm -hmm. a manipulation or whatever. Mm -hmm. They don't know whether that particular intervention uh, is, is appropriate for that subcategory of back pain. So, mm. you know, a posterior disc bulge that is an open fissure subcategory versus a broad base disc bulge, there are two or two entirely different mm. pain mechanisms. You can't treat them the same, mm. or they might have facet joint uh, mm. pain triggers and pathology and arthritis, or, who knows what? Mm -hmm. So uh, it's a matter of getting that expert assessment of yeah. the pain mechanism right up front from the clinician, build some capacity. And, and by the way, you can help in that by fundamental movement patterns to mm -hmm. create efficiency. So mm -hmm. think of the kettlebell athlete mm -hmm. who is learning to move efficiently to win. Mm -hmm. Can they tie their shoes? Can they get their socks and underwear on in the morning? Can they go for a walk and start to propel some of that athleticism all pain free? Well, or remember the stacking wood example, can you teach some footwork in the drop step? You know, can you imagine trying to box out Shaq O'Neal on the court like this? Mm. No, you have to learn mm. the drop step. Uh, drop, the drop step. The drop step, of course. Mm. So, I mean, mm. fundamental footwork, and it doesn't matter whether we're talking boxing, uh, jujitsu, or moving firewood, or uh, turning to get the next beer out of the refrigerator. <laughs> and still, as a last uh, note, I'm I a have... Canadian. You can yep. see. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Uh, as a last note, I, 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 I just I, I have to I just, something just very funny used to pop into my mind. So we would uh, work in Mocklingen all day, come down the funicular, and at the bottom was a uh, a uh, a pub, so to speak. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. And in Mocklingen, as you know, it was French, and I had a reasonable command of French, but my Swiss German was terrible. But I learned Swiss German uh, coming down and going in there and ordering a. Stange. Uh, a stange. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, most definitely. You know, in the videos, I always say... Which is a tall beer. <laughs> yeah, a stange, you know. You know, I always say in the videos, I always say Grüezi mitrand. That's the formal greeting to everybody. And then people no, start... No, 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 no. That's, that's, that's too Zurich. It's Grüezi. 
is yep. more Bernese. No, yeah, <laughs> the, the, the Bern dialect, and, that, and that's crazy. The dialects, we always say the, the, the way the, the folks in Bern, the dialects of, of the Bern folks, is so melodic. And yeah. it's so, it is so inweaved. It, it, I cannot even describe it. It's and we, song. Yeah, yeah, most definitely. And we who live close to the German border, we're more close to the, the German language. That's why the dialect is different. But funny thing is, I live in Torgau. That's, that's the canton, right? Uh, where also um, uh, the, the school is. And funny thing is, that's the, the most hated dialect in all of Switzerland. It's just a, just a funny side note. So isn't, isn't it isn't it fun? I, I I'm I'm going to say this, and and you you may may or may not appreciate this, but before just before we hit the record button, you said to me, "Well, you're a little bit nervous talking to me," and I mm -hmm. said, "I'm a little bit nervous talking to you," mm -hmm. and people will find that strange, perhaps. But now we've spent an hour together, and. I, I, I think there's already a, um, a, a communication and a friendship and an appreciation and mm. it, it hasn't, mm. hasn't something deepened here. Most, most definitely. Yeah, yeah, most definitely. I'm and, not and, nervous you know, anymore. Me, me neither. You know, the, the only thing that I'm, that I'm always, I, uh, even before the podcast, you know, because English is my second language. And even before, I, I, have, I have to focus so hard to to capture the information understand it and then answer back appropriately and that takes a lot of effort but uh that's that's the only thing that i'm struggling with a little bit so i hope it doesn't doesn't show up in the pot but uh i truly appreciate it dr mcgill i have uh, two more things if i can take just a little bit more of your time and uh that is or actually one which is so so crucial we always get asked about this rotational kettlebell exercises now just if i may just set the stage from my understanding and i i'm highly looking forward to your comment um rotational stuff i read from your book that's rotational torque if you keep your spine locked and i i uh see the image in my mind of the fire uh, the the guy who's chopping wood where the, the small X is on that image where the guy is chopping wood and he fully twists and rotates the spine and then he's creating rotational torque. And I asked Dan John, I said, Dan, um, you've, been in, uh, uh, you, you've, you've thrown the discus. How was that for your spine? He said, terrible, but it paid, my, it paid my college, it paid my business, it paid what I did, right? So I understand this concept that it's a problem, rotational torque. Now. I'm imagining I'm starting to work with a kettlebell. Now, most of the kettlebell movements are in the sagittal plane, right? Right here, clean, swing, snatch, especially the ballistics. Now, as soon as I move outside that space, so I'm taking a weight, I'm throwing it outside my space, outside my center of mass, laterally away, I can imagine that my back, and you can correct me, but my understanding is if I throw the kettlebell outside, doing circular cleans, they call it, right? that my back is taking some form of detrimental load, if I may say this. And if I do these, uh, I think they call it figure eights. It's funny because I only, I'm such a huge fan of the basic exercises like Pavel, that's why I love simple and sinister swing and Turkish get up the best uh, kettlebell workout that you can do um, with a kettlebell, where you go down, you reach down, you switch the kettlebell to your other hand, right down beneath, between your legs, and then you come up. And just from a biomechanical understanding, when I watch people move, I see that the lower back is, it is rotating. And it, that there is rotational torque. So what is your take on, on that situation? We need a context. <laughs> So I can twist around. I, I don't have uh, any issues with that at all. If twisting is uh, a pain trigger for a person, then all of a sudden it becomes an issue. So, you know, I hear people say, oh, spines are robust. They're not fragile. Well, that's true. 
until they're not. <laughs> it sounds so simple. Yeah, yeah. So what does rotational twisting do? Uh, if it's excessive, which is twist plus load, so we measured uh, Middle Eastern belly dancers. Now, I, that's one thing I cannot do. So I can't <laughs> demonstrate that. But you yeah. know what I mean. You have yes. massive range of motion in the spine and tremendous athleticism. Do you know, they were all women, do you know that not one of those women had the strength to do a single sit-up? So you, it's a game of trade-offs. You can have tremendous rotational twisting mobility but it's usually at the expense of load bearing and twisting strength. But if you combine mm -hmm. twisting and load mm. and cross the tipping point, the collagenous rings of collagen in the disc are, are somewhat of the architecture like an onion. They're concentric rings. Those rings start to delaminate. They're called radial rents. So there, there's reasons for that. Some of the fibers run 45 and 30 degrees one way, and, and the next layer runs the other way. So when I so twist... Just, just quick, uh, Dr. McGill, because that's what I'm somehow having a problem with. Delamination means it's like it peels off or it breaks apart or... Do you see that split along the red line between layers? Now, that mm -hmm. red split can go all the way around in that particular layer on the onion screen in some people. Uh, it depends how much cumulative uh -huh. uh, load they have taken. Mm -hmm. So okay. that is a common disc injury. Now, some people have facet tropism. So this facet is angled like this and this facet is angled with the same mm -hmm. degree but some people have one open and one closed so we okay. had the world champion woodchuck he was a, a lumberjack games person oh, okay now one facet he could chop and he could do the footwork and whoop the other way was not possible because his facet joints didn't uh, allow oh. that uh, particular athleticism. But that tropism was a uh, benefit and an advantage or, or a, an American baseball pitcher. Don't make them symmetric. They're not. <laughs> you would ruin their athleticism. Wow. So we Don't adapt all of these things. Mm. Uh, and that's why some of us are good at some things and not at others. But uh, anyway, let's get back to these loaded twists. Um, do you know what a slosh pipe is? Yeah, the one with water in. That, yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. So say I had a slosh pipe. Now, I had a doc who came to me, and he was responsible for some UFC fighters. And he came to me to my office, brought the slosh pipe, put it on his shoulders, locked his hips, and went back and forth, getting the water to slosh back and forth. And he said, this is a fabulous strengthening exercise. Would I like to be part of, you know, the business side of it to develop these slosh pipes, uh, create some marketing for them and get in on it? And I said, no, that eventually will tear, radial tear some discs. Now, for the first three months of you giving that to your fighters, they will get a little bit stronger, no question but then they're going to accumulate more stresses of repeated stress strain reversals, causing those rents or delaminations that I showed you. They will become painful and unable to train. And he called me and pardon the language, but oh, you're an effing idiot. And what do you know? And he left my office. Well, as uh. often happens, people who want to uh, I, I don't know, promote themselves on social media or whatnot. They'll go after me a little bit and call me an idiot and that kind of thing. Do you know how many of them have come to me two years later Ooh. apologizing, mm -hmm. saying, could wow. you now help me with my back because everything has failed and my training career is over? And what do I do? It's a I, ne I, I never experience. mention it wow. on the internet. I never say, yeah. oh, you bastard, you know, you, you, you really took mm. a piece out of me a couple of years ago. Mm. I don't. I, I figure this is a human mm. who is learning. Mm. Uh, and, uh, you know, I, I, I really dislike them to start. And I have to swallow that and say, here's a person who is asking for help. Who needs help? What, yeah. what, what can I say?
all I can say is uh, to my very best of my ability, I will mm -hmm. try and help you. Excellent. But anyway, that doc came to me a year or so later and he said, whole different attitude this time. Professor McGill, sir, you are right. I used the slosh pipe. I've torn my own disc and I've torn two of my fighters. Can you help? I've done this with professional uh, uh, sports teams who have hired people and said, oh, yeah, keep twisting and get good rotational strength and athleticism. And then McGill, a year later, would you come in because we've now disabled some of our top flight superstar athletes. So mm -hmm. now that I've uh, said that, let me take another take on this. Mm -hmm. We did a study. Well, I'm, what motivated the study? I was working with uh, several, and I'm not talking duffer UFC fighters. I'm mm -hmm. talking ones who were at the, they either fought for the championship in their weight uh, division at mm -hmm. one time, or they mm -hmm. were the champion. So these were not duffers. Mm -hmm. I've also uh, had a little bit of a, a play in a role with some of the top influential MMA guys. So when you measure the ones who kick hard, Watch the mechanics of it. Do they twist their spines or uh, do they go on one leg and they kick yeah. and the beginning of the yeah. kick is a hip. They snap the hips down. Bam. So do you see what I did? I snapped the hips down and then the hip, the leg comes around as a whip. Wow. And those are the guys who hurt you. By the way, Pavel. I've measured Pavel. Pavel, if you're down on Santa Monica Beach with him, having a little bit, at any time, he can sweep out your legs from underneath you with just the power of his rotational core and unleashing his hips and kicking your legs out from underneath you. So when you examine those mechanics, it is a stone. But it, again, it's hip athleticism. Bam! Mm. And it is mm. a pulse. Mm. Remember the kettlebell pulse. Yeah. Boom! You're priming yeah. the neurology for the one-inch punch, the mm. the hip snap down, um, uh, etc. And then I measure the guys who look impressive, big muscles and whatnot. And then I measure their strike dynamics. Big muscles. A muscle creates force and stiffness when it contracts. Mm. So. It slows down the punch, and when you measure the punch profile, it spreads it out over time and reduces the peak. Mm. So in a way, you can consider it, it's a big punch, but it's soft in that it's spread out over time. The guy who has the torsional control in the hips, it's boom! It's Bruce Lee. You pulse, you relax, and, and as Bruce Lee described, I focus all the energy at the time of impact. Mm. Bang! Mm. Boom! There's the key, mate. Wow. Mm. So do you see it's this blend of stability, immobility, creating a stone underneath the unleashing of the distal athleticism, and then at the time of impact, they don't hit you with their fist. If they're a welterweight, they hit you with 170 some odd pounds of granite. Mm. And to be on the in the same room just measuring this and then to think a human will withstand this kind of <laughs> yeah. uh, impact. So, you know, so I then took a group of Muay Thai fighters and we trained them. So we measured their uh, strike ability, arm strikes and leg kicks. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. We also took a group of graduate students. Now, graduate students typically are not very athletic. Mm -hmm. We trained them both. Both groups increased their strike closing velocity. So the first pulse closing velocity, which is mm -hmm. important if you're going to win. And mm -hmm. then the second pulse to turn your body to stone. Mm -hmm. Um, so core stability training increased their leg and speed strike athleticism. 
anyway, I can go on and on and on about this. Um, but again, it comes from context. We, if you want to get back to the splitting of the wood, uh, I would get graduate students when I was a professor and we would, you know, on the weekends, they would come out to our place and we'd, we'd stack and split some gnarly firewood. And I would have a heavy, maybe a six pound maul or an eight mm. pound maul. Mm. And the guys, the, the big bodybuilders, particularly. Yeah, using all of the muscle, yeah. <laughs> and uh and then the skinny old man give me that <laughs> karate lock hit it with the hips and the dynamics and the uh, uh the optimization of stability mobility and then just as the mall was hitting the wood i'd squeeze <laughs> so anyway but my my, my yeah. point was they mm. learned very quickly that uh, chopping is technique and you can go through a great big spine range of motion and gyration and it's nowhere near as effective as using the hips and the shoulders locking the core transferring the energy and it's a sharp yeah um anyway and then i'd show them oh by the way there's a knot in the wood there you should have turned it and and split right there <laughs> but <laughs> anyway those are the dirty tricks on top of the science that uh you know the old men uh, <laughs> the old no. men tricks yeah but but that's we, what we, i'm getting we can talk yeah. about all of yeah. that uh, some other time but that's Most a definitely. little bit of a start on rotational uh training athletic performance and if, injury resilience if i'm just reflect real quick on that because it's such a big issue or sh such a big question in the kettlebell world um as soon as long as you generate the strength from your hips keeping your spine fairly locked because you have strong hips and you have a good neural drive you understand the neuromuscular component you know how to tense then let's let's take the the pain question out of the equation just for most people who don't have pain then yes you may be, you're maybe safe with a couple of those rotational exercises. Yet what I, what I have gathered from your podcast, and that would be a final, final comment from you, um, which uh, I'm also looking forward to. Um, when it comes to rotation, I believe if we just envision a windmill or a Turkish getup where you can use heavy weights, it is a safe maneuver if you do it right, of course, if you have the technique, if you have the structure, if you have the, um, like we mentioned, the, the, the resistance to shear to a certain extent, and you're safe with the movement because it is slow and controlled. Yet, as soon as we start adding velocity, because that's one of the comments that you said, high velocity, low force, a good thing. High force, low velocity, a good thing. But if we combine high velocity with high force, which would be a heavy clean with a heavy kettlebell, which we see a lot of times do where just the kettlebell flies all around in the lateral space, it just might be a great recommendation uh, if, if you could take over from here, if I'm right or wrong, it might be a great recommendation to say, hey, maybe keep it slow and steady and be careful with the velocity stuff. Well, all we can do, because we don't have context of a person in front of us, we can only stay with scientific principles. So your, your expression of the principles are correct. But now let's get someone in front of us and let's do a simple test. Let's take an Olympic bar and we'll start by putting an Olympic bar on their shoulders. And they might say, is it okay to flex my spine? And I will say, good, stand, tuck your pelvis underneath with a posterior pelvic tilt, and now do the opposite. Now do that 10 times. Did you get pain? And if they say yes, what do you think going down to a deep squat with butt wink will do? Mm -hmm. It will cause their pain. Mm -hmm. If they pass, you just got a little bit of a green light now add a little bit of load wow. and you will converge on a tipping point. I can do exactly the same thing with any combination of load 
or athletic uh, endeavor. So there's a little bit of a thought process on the art and science mm -hmm. of how we will converge. Now, if you think you're going to train just under the tipping point, and that'll be fine, you will probably lose at that game ultimately as well. So there's a hell of a science to this. Wow. Uh, yeah. let, me, let me give you a closing thought here. Let's take, uh, so the Swiss love F1 car racing, right? There's a lot mm -hmm. of car mechanics in the world mm. who can build cars. They can fix cars. How many of them can build the winning F1 race car five years in a row? Hmm. 20? Less. Out of the whole world, probably less. So my mm. point mm. is, how many can rebuild a spine from point of damage, pain, disabled performance, back through to world-class performance. A small handful. Uh, you. Well, mm. uh, I will compare my record with anybody. Mm. Uh, I can put it that way. Um, but uh, th there are a few others as well. Uh, there are some who I would... Uh, you know, you ask me about uh, certain sports, and there are some sports where I don't have enough experience in, and I will bring in a consultant, or I will pass on that person, uh, maybe with a few uh, preliminary thoughts or guiding notes or whatever. Mm -hmm. So <laughs> anyway, that just gives a little bit of a context. This isn't an easy game. The yeah. art and science when we have a person in front of us is a whole different discussion than generic back pain. Is it good or is it bad? And usually I just have to say, well, I, I, I don't know why well, it depends. We have to have yeah. the person in front of us and we will converge. So I can't answer questions about nonspecific back pain. And I have a little bit of trouble with people who say, oh, you know, nonspecific back pain, uh, and then they will say something general about mm -hmm. it. Uh, mm -hmm. Could you mm -hmm. imagine us having a discussion about non-specific leg pain? It wouldn't be tolerated. It's quite ridiculous. Mm -hmm. And yet There's we always seem a cause, to, yeah, yeah mm -hmm. we seem yeah. to have this attitude with uh, non-specific uh, back pain. And if I just may uh, add to this, I think that's you're now just confirming what this methodology or or what. The philosophy in fitness and treating people, helping people really is, and that is context specific. It depends. You have to work with the people. You have to see, you know, for example, we had, we had a mother, she came in and she had athleticism from the get go. She had great kinesthetic sense from the get go. The Turkish get up and the heart style swing were loaded so fast. It, it was great. Then we had a not, another client. She had a huge issue with her kinesthetic sense. So we stayed with, with the ultimate basic exercises to not go uh, over overdo it. Yet the, the problem that I see, and that goes for me as a YouTuber as well, for somebody who pre, uh, creates content, people want specific answers. It's, hey, that's the best exercise. That's the worst exercise. That's what you should do. That's what you shouldn't do. And because the game is so context specific, yet the demand is for an obvious solution that's kind of like a dilemma that that i sometimes have to have to battle with and understand how can i produce content that is somehow clickable but it's not you know it's yeah well it's, it's the for, arts like you mentioned you, you you mentioned english being your second language that was a very eloquent summary oh thank you <laughs> really appreciate it uh dr mcgill this was this was an awesome podcast a lot of information i have to digest this stuff and and i will uh, especially in the editing process when you hear it again then it sticks and yeah i think the title of the podcast would be context matters or it depends or something like this and i really appreciate the time i always took two hours of your time which it's it's i 100 appreciate it well, maybe you'd like to do it again sometime and we can uh, be a bit more uh, context specific. <laughs> Most definitely. Thank you very much, Dr. McGill. It was okay. an honor. And, and thank you for all you do as well. Thank you.
Thank you very much. The world of kettlebells is dominated by two training styles called heart style and kettlebell sport. Although vastly different in nature, they have been proven to work and give you the most bang for your buck. Whenever you pick up a kettlebell, if you apply the technique correctly and are able to differentiate between the two. Now for beginners, this task might be understandably confusing. With our upcoming hybrid style masterclass in 100 lessons, you will embrace the emergence of the hybrid style movement where you will learn how to combine the best of both worlds and become a master at handling the kettlebell. Join the next revolution in kettlebell training now and sign up for our early birds list to stay up to date and receive an exclusive discount in release week. Link is in the description.